views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. Tonight's guest has been an assembly member serving the Northwest and North Central Bronx for the last 25 years. He sees one of the hallmarks of his service to be in constituent services and he's also been at the forefront of the creation of a business improvement district in Kingsbridge and schools in Riverdale and Kingsbridge. Most recently, he spearheaded the idea of rebates for commuters who go through tolls on the Henry Hudson Bridge. We're also going to talk with him this evening about the recently passed state budget, upcoming battle over rent laws, and a variety of other subjects. Please join me in welcoming back to Bronx Talk, the Assemblyman from the 81st District in the Bronx. And I'm going to list the neighborhoods. It includes Riverdale, Kingsbridge, Van Cortland Village, Kingsbridge Heights, Marble Hill, Norwood, Woodlawn, and Wakefield. And tonight, it is your 25th appearance on our program, which is also 25 years old. Wow. Assemblyman Jeff Dino, it's nice to see you. It's always good to be here. <laughs> nice to have you with us. I thought um, just uh, since we talked about longevity to start, um, let's just get a little perspective. Um, you've been a legislator now for a quarter century. How have things changed in the Assembly, and has your job changed at all uh, in the quarter century since you started? I think it's changed in, in two major ways. One, uh, sort of generally, uh, things I think are more open now, uh, more transparent. I'm not saying there isn't room for improvement. Uh, things have gotten better in that sense uh, over the years, but also as a person who's been there for quite a while now, I have a greater ability to get things done both legislatively and for my district. Because of your seniority? Seniority helps and, get and things done. And experience, I'm assuming. Yes. Um, yes. Is it harder or easier to get things done? Uh, I, I, easier for you, I understand. You know how to navigate things. You know more people, and I, I get that. But in general, the, the things that you might be passionate about, is it easier to get them passed? Uh, are systems better, or are we still kind of <laughs> getting through and you got to fight for everything you want? I think you have to fight for everything. <laughs> uh, you always have to be vigilant. You have to constantly be trying to make... Um, alliances with people, you know, in a legislative body, you're not, you know, a lone wolf. You have mm -hmm. to be able to work with others in order to get support for what you want to get done. But if you get enough support, we can get things done. And so while the assembly itself, I think, has gotten much better in recent years, the fact that we also have more uh, ideologically aligned people in the Senate to us now. Well, that's very is, recent. Is a, a very recent and, a, and, a, and also a big help. Uh, and aside from the fact that you have more experience and you know more people, you know, and you kind of uh, have the benefits of that, have you changed? Have you changed your approach? Have you been educated about, well, you know what, I can now do this or I can't do this based on your experience? Well, at, at the beginning, I used to <clears throat> have to rely a lot on the advice of others, and of course I still do, uh, but now more often than not I'm the one who's giving advice to others. Uh, contrary to what people think, there has been a very large turnover in the assembly in recent years. I think at least half the members have only been in the assembly for maybe six years. Um, so while there are some very senior members, there are some people in the middle, there are a lot of newer members. Some of them are younger. Some of the new members aren't so young, but uh, there are a lot of new people with different ideas, and that's good that we're constantly uh, you know, recharging ourselves. Uh, you, we, you went through, and I say we, because in the borough of the Bronx and in the North Bronx went through um, a difficult political season with the race between <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Jeff Klein and Alessandra Biaggi. Um, she has turned out to be a, a, a good elected official. I'm, I'm guessing that would be your assessment at this point. Well, she's brand new. I think she has a, a lot to, uh, to do and to learn. Uh, but I'm optimistic about her. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and I have every intention of working closely with her. We, we've had several mm -hmm. town hall meetings at my office, as you well know, <coughs> organized. We included her. We wanted to make sure that we're all part of it because what I've always believed strongly is that it's crucial that the elected officials in our community work closely together, and that includes uh, the state senators. She's one of three state senators in my district, the other two being Senator Bailey and Senator Rivera. Um, my two Congress members, uh, Congressman Engel covers the bulk of the district, but I also have Congress member Espayat, and I have mostly Council Member Cohen covering my district, but I also have a little piece of Councilman Cabrera. I, I mean, it's no secret I've moderated uh, some of the town hall meetings uh, that you've had, and I would have to agree. You, you don't always see in one region people working together. Uh, there seems to be that, that cohesiveness. That, that's, that's a helpful thing for constituents, I would think. I think it is. If you want to get things done, it's better <laughs> working together than working at odds. So uh, I've worked with all these elected officials for quite some time. State Senator Biagi is new, uh, but I have uh, every reason to believe that this is going to be very good in terms of our working relationship. I'm very Let, optimistic. Let's go back to um, the legislature and the budget process. Um, you know, the, the, you got both sides of the coin, I think, this year. Uh, there were um, people who said, you know, things uh, turned out very well. Uh, others said, you know what? Uh, same old thing. We, we, we didn't really have the kind of input uh, that we wanted to get. Uh, you don't have two, three men in a room. You have two, two men and a woman in a room. Um, what did you feel about the process this year? And then we can talk about specifics. Every single <clears throat> year, without exception, I walk away from the budget process with two opposite thoughts. One is, wow, this is great. Look at all the wonderful things we got in the budget or some of the bad things we kept out. And then I say, but darn, we, there are some things that we wanted in the budget that weren't included or some things we didn't want in the budget that were included. So every year it's always a mixed bag, but I think on balance we did very well this year. We uh, covered a lot of important areas in terms of education dollars, in terms of transportation issues, just a whole mm -hmm. laundry list of things that we got done in the budget. Was, was it perfect? Of course not. It's never going to be perfect. Everything is a compromise. Don't forget, we're dealing with people, not only, it's not only people in the Bronx, we have to deal with 150 assembly members, including people from upstate, including people from more conservative areas that don't necessarily have the same uh, political beliefs that we have. So you have to kind of put everything together in order to uh, pass a budget. So it's always going to be a mixed bag, but I think I think it turned out pretty well this year. I pulled out a quote from City and State magazine that did um, they do their uh, you know winners and losers. I'm, I'm not going to evaluate any of that, but I thought the um, write-up on uh, the speaker, Carl Hasty was interesting. Um, and and uh, they wrote, the assembly speaker did get plenty of what he wanted in the state budget, but the closer everyone got to a deal, the more he appeared to be ceding ground from recreational marijuana to congestion pricing to the permanent tax cap, tax cap to the public financing of election campaigns. Now the pressure will be on to get a favorable deal on marijuana post-budget and to deliver stronger protections for tenants before the state's rent regulations expire. Um, do, you, do you feel that way? Was, is that a proper analysis or do you think it's too tough? What, what's your evaluation of that? I, I think a lot of people write these analyses uh, that don't always know everything they need mm -hmm. to know. I think the speaker did very well in terms of advocating for the priorities of our conference and it included not only the budget uh, issues but also uh, issues which frankly don't belong in the budget but which often are. For example, we did the, the largest package of criminal justice reform in a generation in the state budget this year. That was a very high priority, maybe the top priority of the speaker and many members of our conference. So we did bail reform and speedy trial reform, um, uh, just a whole bunch of things to make our criminal justice system fairer. That was in the budget and that was led by the speaker. So some of his top priorities were in there, some of the priorities of the governor or the majority leader of the Senate, but on a lot of things, probably most things, all three of them were on the same wavelength in the first place. Uh, let's talk about this Henry Hudson Bridge rebate, which has created a bit of a stir. It's a very interesting concept. Um, in previous dialogues, I don't remember if it was privately or on the air, you were not in favor of congestion pricing. Um, I guess you came around to see that it was something that had to be done, but you uh, felt that 
and, and tell me if I'm wrong, you felt that uh, constituents of yours who may go down uh, the Henry Hudson Parkway and then go to Lower Manhattan would pay two fares uh, under a congestion pricing rule below 61st Street, so you got them a rebate on the Henry Hudson Bridge. Talk about a little bit about your thinking about it, and then we'll address some of the objections some have raised about it. Okay. I mean, I, I was not a lover of congestion pricing. I have There's a <coughs> number of reasons why I thought it's problematic. However, one thing I think <coughs> we all agreed upon this year was that we needed to raise big bucks for the MTA and for mass transit. And that's what was done in the budget. So I wanted to make sure that we had the best possible outcome for the city as a whole, but the Bronx in particular, and especially for my district. That's my job, to advocate for my district. Now, the, the Henry Hudson Bridge toll was only one of a few issues that I discussed with Pat Foy, who is uh, the head of the MTA now. I talked about uh, the, 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 that I want bus service improvements to be like the top priority in terms of the Bronx. The Attleboro's not only care about the subways, we care about bus service. And I had uh, his assurances uh, and I felt confident about it that that was going to be a priority once uh, congestion pricing did kick in. <clears throat> Another thing I've been very loud about is that uh, subway stations and, and railroad stations as well have to become handicapped accessible. They have to have elevators. And the process for putting in those elevators has been way too slow. And I've been given assurances that that process is going to be accelerated. Well, there, there was a lawsuit that was successful that's going to require any uh, reconstructed station to have an elevator. Right. But even if a station isn't being reconstructed, I, I always point to the Mashalu Jerome station, that station needs elevators, and it shouldn't wait, and I think it's going to happen relatively soon now. The point is, those two issues I felt confident about having had those discussions. Uh, the issue of the Henry Hudson Bridge toll, this to me was, this is something which should have been dealt with years ago. The bridge is a very small bridge compared to, say, the Whitestone or the Throg's Neck, and yet there's a significant toll on it. And if you're going, say, from the southern tip of Riverdale, just to go to the northern tip of Manhattan, you have to pay that toll. And, and so there were really two reasons why I think that toll was unjust. One, I thought it was a lot of money for the, for the people in the Bronx who use it. And this <clears throat> rebate is only for Bronx residents. It is not for Westchester or Connecticut or anybody else. Um, and two, because there is a toll there, there are a fair number of people who, instead of taking the bridge, will drive down, into, down the hill into Kingsbridge and into Marble Hill into streets that are already overcrowded, that already have a lot of traffic. They'll cr uh, tr uh, crowd those streets even more, pollute the air in the two neighborhoods even more simply to avoid the toll. That's called toll shopping. That's one of the things that the MTA and, and the supporters of congestion pricing said they wanted to avoid. Is, is there documentation of that, or are you just making that uh, assumption that because it is logical that people would do I, that? I, I know it's true. Do I have uh, data to back it up? Of course yeah. not. I know, I know me. Um, I know that often I will do just that, and I know other people will do it as well. They'll travel much further in order to save a few bucks. You can go People, around Broadway and get to Dykeman Street that way, That's for right. So they're, they're going to save a few bucks. It'll take them longer. They'll be using more gas. They'll be polluting the air. They'll bring in more traffic into Kingsbridge and Marble Hill. This will have an impact on that. Uh, but I think the fact that the toll is essentially eliminated for Bronx people, I think, is a big victory for the Bronx. Now, people will have to register with Easy Pass specifically in order to uh, benefit so from So if you program. have Easy Pass, you still have to do some consideration to get that? You'll still have to, I don't know, I'm not sure the details, but you'll probably have to fill out some form or go online and do something. Um, and then when you go over the bridge, the toll will be charged and then, and then immediately back. credited. Uh, and and um, uh, does that start uh, like right now or you, it goes to when congestion pricing hits, they say 2021? It'll be before congestion pricing hits. It'll probably be in approximately a year from now. Uh, and it, it's, not, uh, it's not exactly part of congestion pricing. You know, so, some people who know less than they should before they speak have said, uh, that this is a carve-out. That is what they've said. I was just about to bring that up. <laughs> it's not a carve-out. Um, it's, it's, it's not like uh, we've said anybody from the Bronx should be exempt from congestion pricing. No, people who cross the bridge, unfortunately, will have to pay the congestion pricing fee once it if, kicks in, if they go into the zones. Below but, 61st Right, Street. but if you're going to 
a doctor at Columbia Presbyterian or at Cornell or NYU, um, or I guess there's some other doc, you know, hospitals in the, in, outside the zone, or you're going to Fairway on 125th Street, you won't have to pay the toll. And so people will go over the bridge instead of going into Kingsbridge. Uh, transit advocates have said it's self-defeating. We want to get people out of their cars. We don't want to make it more convenient for them to drive. We'd rather them say, you know what, get, take the subway downtown and, or, or some other uh, means other than taking your car. Well, I, I would have to respectfully disagree with that. You know, th th maybe they want to get people out of their cars, but some people can't get out of their cars that easily. There are people, as I mentioned, who are, let's say, going to the doctor at, at Columbia Presbyterian, an elderly person, perhaps, somebody who can't get around that easily, uh, they, they should have to take, you know, take the, the bus to the subway, to the bus. Maybe they can't. Uh, I think it's a little insensitive to talk that way. And this is not going to, nobody's going to suddenly get in their car because of this. People who, who drive will drive. People who take mass transit will take mass transit. This is not going to encourage one additional person to get in their car. And I think the people who are saying that they're not from the Bronx for the most part. Uh, the AAA uh, was here um, a couple of weeks ago, and, and um, they were concerned that in the whole congestion pricing, all the money went to transit funding as opposed to even something for road repair. I mean, if, if you drive and other people drive in the Bronx, you know we have <laughs> very difficult traffic and uh, road issues. Mm -hmm. um, is that a mistake? Should, should it be carved out? You know, we have in this city this tension between drivers and mass transit riders. I, I mean... We, we certainly should keep our I roads do both in good shape. I can. <laughs> but no, I think the congestion pricing money, when it starts, should go to mass transit. Uh, you have indicated to me that um, the large majority of people who complain about um, the MTA uh, to your office uh, complain about buses as opposed to subways. That's what, correct. What, what is it that they say the city came out with the Better Buc Buses Action Plan? Apparently, it's not a finished deal. Um, what, what do we expect out of that plan, and what do you think uh, your constituents need? I, I think there, there are several different complaints. One is waiting a long time for the bus. Another is the buses are too overcrowded, so when you wait, you can't even get on the bus. When it gets there, you have to wait for the second or third bus in some cases. Uh, the, the plan is a work in progress, the, uh, the city's plan. I think we need more buses, and this is one of the things I specifically spoke to uh, Pat Foy about that we not only need buses that actually work and modern buses to replace the bed, you know, the old ones, but we need more buses. If you add even one bus, for example, to the number 10 line, that one bus will make several trips during the day. Uh, so it will mean that there's a shorter wait, and we probably need more than one bus, but we need additional buses if we want these lines to, to be efficient. Some of the bus routes may have to change. Uh, some, some of them are way too long. Uh, so, you know, when you see three buses, the same bus come to you, one, two, three, it gets very irritating for people. I know Especially I've Especially after they've that. waited uh, 20 or 30 minutes for yeah. those three buses. It, it's very aggravating. Even if you're towards the beginning of the line, sometimes uh, you'll still see that kind of bus bunching, as it's called. I think it probably was about 20 years ago, maybe not quite that many, that um, the city put in the articulated buses, these double buses. Yeah, I hate those. I, I, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm not particularly a fan either. But I think that gave this impression that we're able to move more people around. But uh, many times they are big, big empty buses riding through quiet neighborhoods at night. And um, so maybe if rather than adding articulated buses, if they added individual buses and had those more frequently, we might do a better job. That's my Absolutely, point. and I've made that point. The articulated, not only that, but the articulated buses, when they started, for example, the articulated buses on the number one line, um, they have to make the bus stops longer. Yeah, they ate up tons of parking spots. Exactly. So we, we lost a lot of parking spots. By having the articulated buses, it kind of gave them almost permission to have fewer buses. I think it's better to have the regular size buses, have them run more frequently, have it sort of more evenly uh, spread out um, and spaced together time-wise um, closer than they are right now. Let's talk about housing. Um, there, there are so many issues that we could talk about. Um, uh, you uh, indicated that, um, and, and also it was in that uh, piece we read about city and state, that upcoming uh, rent regulation battle is out there. 
Um, what, what's happening now and what do we expect and what are we going to look for as we go forward? Well, I'm very excited and optimistic about what's going to happen this year. I just had a town hall meeting uh, last week just on rent issues. We had 100 people who showed up um, and people are, people can't afford to live in New York. Homelessness has gone up because rents have gone up. The Assembly, year after year, has passed a package of bills uh, that we're going to pass again this year, but with, with more bills and stronger bills because we feel that we have a better shot at actually getting it done. So, for example, we want to uh, pass MCI reform. What we've done each year is we've passed legislation that would make major capital improvements instead of being a permanent part of the base of a rent that would then get uh, compounded each time there's a rent increase. Uh, the bill we've passed in the past uh, was such that it would be a temporary surcharge. This year, we're thinking of going even further and just abolishing MCIs altogether. The logic being that if a landlord puts in a new elevator or a new boiler, they, they get a tax break anyway, just by the fact that their profits are down. But in addition, they have a more valuable building as a result. So the landlord benefits from doing those improvements without having to get any rent hikes. Uh, the same thing would hold for what's called IAIs, individual impart apartment improvements, but there are other things we need to do. We need to eliminate the 20% vacancy bonus. When somebody moves out, the landlord gets an automatic 20% rent increase. For what? For doing nothing? Um, and, and, and vacancy decontrol. We have a package of eight or nine bills that I believe we will pass after the assembly hearings at the beginning of May on these issues, and I'm hoping that the Senate follows us in passing these bills. Well, why haven't these things been addressed before? Is it simply a political matter? Well, we've, we've addressed it before, but the Senate <clears throat> hasn't. But the Senate, the control of the Senate has shifted. So I'm hopeful uh, that the Senate will start passing these bills. And I, and I think I have every reason to believe they would. I hope they do. I had an interesting dialogue last week with uh, Assemblyman Michael Blake uh, about the public financing of um, campaigns. And there was um, great um, enthusiasm about uh, the, the various aspects of campaign finance reform mm -hmm. and election reform that was done. But um, uh, the, in essence, the governor uh, kicked the can down the road and said, now we're going to have a, um, a commission to determine uh, how to handle public uh, financing uh, of election and campaigns. Um, uh, is that the way to go about it? Do you, are you happy with it? Are you frustrated by it? I, I'm <laughs> judging not, from the face you just gave me, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a big lover of these commissions. <clears throat> I wish we could have done it uh, during, the, during the recent uh, negotiations. I've been a longtime supporter of public financing and of small donor matching funds. Uh, we did pass a huge package of election law reform bills. Uh, the very first week we came back into the legislative session in January it was, it was the biggest package of election reform bill that I think we've ever done. Um, and of course, the, uh, the people who w wanted that are now, you know, started saying, well, it's not enough. But it actually wasn't enough. There are more things we can do. Uh, this is one of them. Is the commission the best way to go? No, but there wasn't an agreement uh, by, the, by this deadline of March 31st. If the, the commission will make recommendations or not, and then the legislature can, e can either accept them by doing nothing or come back into special session in December and make changes or, or it, anything it, it wants, it, it's actually. It's kind of a, you know, a, a, a back and forth thing because on one hand, you don't want to have every decision made have to go through the budget process because then you don't get a proper dialogue on I it. I agree. So in this case, the, the attempt is to have a proper dialogue on it, yet it seems to delay it, and then it sets up people on a panel, and all of a sudden that gets very politicized, and people get control of it, and you don't really get the dialogue. So I'm not sure what, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not sure what the proper answer is. Well, I, I think the answer is we should <clears throat> not be passing major policy <clears throat> matters in the budget. That's what I think. Right. We did a number of things, like the criminal justice reform, for example, but we shouldn't be doing that. So a couple of months ago when I said we shouldn't be doing this in the budget, even though I support all this, you know, some of the advocates, again, not from the Bronx, um, went crazy saying, how could you say that? We've got to do this now and blah, blah, blah. Well, we didn't do it during the budget process, um, but we still have an opportunity. We could do it during the remainder of the legislative session, or we could wait and see what the commission does and then uh, accept by, by doing nothing, basically, or modify what the commission does. But we can make the changes, and it can be done this year. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the district. If you ride through um, the Riverdale part of the district, um, walk through or try to take a bus through uh, the 
level of construction is considerable and um, it eats up parking spaces. I mean, you can, streets that you would normally take, you know, a minute and a half to go through take you 10 or 20 minutes sometimes given the backup. Uh, you've uh, come out about um, the idea of who really controls how much parking is used up. Talk a little bit about that. And I think it would be interesting for any neighborhood uh, that goes through construction, which I think we're all doing in the Bronx now, uh, on how best to manage these things. It, it's very hard. First of all, there are two different types of construction we're talking about. There's the mm -hmm. uh, temporary, although endless, work that's being done by Con Ed and the Department of Design and Construction um, on, on pipes and stuff underground. But then there's also construction of new buildings. So, for example, I've, um, I, I've come complained about this numerous times. It happens there's a project across the street from my building on my block. Now, I, I park in a garage, so I'm not directly affected by that, but a lot of my neighbors are. The, the construction site is a, has a very large perimeter on 238th, Blackstone and 237th. The city gave them a permit and they took away 19 parking spots. And this has happened, as you know, on Ford Independent Street, on street after street. The city just just gives them the permits. And so they give them the permit. You know, I look at some of these blocks and the construction is not taking place there. I mean, I realize they need staging areas, but um, a lot of times the people who work there get to park their cars there where the people who live there don't. I always wondered, and I have many friends in construction, but I, I, I you know, when I go to a job, I've got to either take mass transit or figure out where to put my car. That's and right. somebody else goes to a job, uh, you know, it's not, it's not easy, I promise you. But, you know, you're hurting the local neighborhood. I guess that's what you're aiming I, I, at. I think that the permission Almost to... Almost out of time, so finish it up. Permission out. to take away parking should be more than a rubber stamp. It should be carefully examined and then decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Do you really need to take away all the spots? Could it be just part of it? Is this legislation that, that is on the way? Is that how we're going to deal with it, you think? Or I'm not sure that there's a legislative response to it. I Got think it. we have to speak out on it. Uh, Assemblymember Jeff Dinowitz, thank you for making your 25th appearance on our program. At some point, we'll get number 26. We appreciate your time this evening. Okay, thank you. Thank you, folks. If you have further questions or comments on anything you heard on tonight's show or anything going on in the Bronx, then email them to us at bronxtalk at bronxnet. Dot org. You send us a tweet at Bronx Talk or post them on our Facebook page. We thank our producer is Helen Greenberg. The directors are William Guzman and Nick Marrero. We will see you next week. Good night.